So it is my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce the, as, as Zach said, the Entre Entrepreneur of the Year, Leonard uh, uh, Schle Schle Schleicher, Schleicher. Um, <laughs> who founded Regeneron uh, in 1988. He's currently the President and Chief Executive Officer uh, since the inception of the company. Len, together with his President and Chief Scientific Officer, George, I I'm not, sorry, I need my glasses. Yeah, Kaplan, that's a hard one. Jan Kapolos has built the company from a tiny startup into one of the world's leading biotechnology companies with a unique science-driven culture. Regeneron's ability to consistently translate science into medicine has led to seven FDA-approved treatments and 20 product candidates, all of which were homegrown in its laboratories. Regeneron's medicines and pipeline are designed to help patients with eye disease, heart disease, al allergic and inflammatory, disease, inflammatory diseases, pain, cancer, infectious diseases, and so forth. The company is accelerating and improving the traditional drug development process through its proprietary VelociSuite technologies. Uh, and its, uh, its ambitions and initiatives such as Regeneron Genetics Center. Len has been recognized as one of Barron's best CEOs, a Yale School of Ma Management legend in leadership, and, and Ernst & Young Life Sciences Entrepreneur of the Year. Under his leader, leadership, Regeneron has been repeatedly voted the number one biopharmaceutical company to work for by Science Magazine and has been consistently ranked a top 10 most innovative company by Forbes. Len graduated Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude from Cornell University in Biological Sciences in 1973 before earning his MD and PhD in pharmacology from the University of Virginia. He is a licensed physician certified by neurology, uh, by the uh, American Board of Psychi Psychiatry and Neurology. Please join me in, in uh, welcoming him. Thank you, Lance. You read those exactly the way I hoped you would. <laughs> Um, I, I'm used to giving a lot of talks, and most of the time I like to think I give good talks, but my family always says um, that's because the people you most frequently talk to are your employees, so they think you're funny and, and on point and all that. Um, so I'm very nervous to talk here today, not because I'm coming back to Cornell for the first time in a while, but because my family's actually sitting here. Um, <laughs> and so I'm very nervous, and, and I would appreciate uh, no matter what happens, um, at the end, a rousing round of applause, <laughs> stand up. Um, I've decided that I will even uh, try and soften my critics up by showing their pictures. Um, here, here I am happy. In the top right, uh, in the bottom left is my wife, Harriet, um, another Cornelian. We've been married for uh, nearly 45 years. In the upper left, uh, is my dad, um, who graduated in uh, 1933, um, came here on a Latin and Greek scholarship. His, he told his father he was going to college. His father said, we might be able to get you five bucks. Um, good luck. Uh, he uh, came here and he paid for his room and board by uh, sweeping at Johnny's Big Red Grill and by waiting tables at fraternities. Um, in the fall of 29, the stock market crashed, um, which if that happened today, might affect the Schleifers a lot more than it affected them back then, because he didn't have any stock, and it didn't make a difference, but he saw all these people packing up their trunks, and he couldn't understand why they were going home, and, uh, and so I lived in a uh, depression-influenced uh, uh, home. And there is uh, my son, uh, who is um, a graduate in 03, and is now a federal uh, prosecutor. Um, he was involved in that case uh, where people were trying to get into colleges and set the bail for some of those actresses. But the good news, I found out I could mention that because Cornell is not involved in any way. <laughs> uh, so that's enough about them. Enough, I hope that they will think that uh, uh, they'll be softened up when they criticize later. Um, I want to tell you just a few minutes about Regeneron, um, who we are, what we do, why we do it, uh, and, but most importantly, and I'm just going to do that for a few minutes, I want to spend time with Lance answering questions that he may have or you may have uh, so we can turn this uh, more 
into a dialogue. You get enough professors lecturing at you, I'm sure, on campus. You don't need somebody trying to pretend they're a professor. Um, we've been doing this for 30 years. Um, uh, started the company in 1988, and, uh, and you'll see later, um, we were uh, only now are we considered an overnight success. Um, it was really uh, 30 years in the making. Um, you, you met my wife, Harriet, who's my, uh, uh, what I would say, my life partner for 45 years and my evening wife. This is my daytime wife, George Ankopoulos, who we've been partners for 30 years at Regeneron. Uh, Harriet tells me what to do at home. George tells me what to do at work. Um, I get to decide which way to come to the office, which route to take, until the board thought it would be better that I was driven. So I don't get to make too many decisions. But I'm very lucky. And if you want to know, um, if you want to know how to succeed in life, if one of the secrets that I've learned is choose your partners uh, well. We were once a very small company. I started the company. Uh, uh, I was working on the faculty at Cornell Medical School as an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology. Um, I had this idea, we can get a little bit into that in the Q&A, but we needed a place to call World Headquarters. Uh, the superintendent in the hospital housing I was living was a drunk, they fired him. I rented his apartment, put up a sign and started and called it Regeneron World Headquarters. Um, that was in 1988. Uh, but since then, uh, the only we like to think we're still a small company, um, but uh, we've grown. Obviously, um, we have done a lot of things. We've got 7,000 employees right now. Uh, we've got seven drugs approved. Uh, we've sequenced nearly 500,000 people in genomics. Uh, we've got a robust uh, pipeline. Um, and I think it's because we've been willing to do things our way and not the conventional way. I don't think that you can go into this business of biotechnology and just think that, well, I'm going to start a biotech company, make a billion bucks, and sail off into the sunset. You know, all that is sort of the, the end of, of, of a long journey. But the focus we've always felt that steered us well is to be on the science. And the science has to drive the business. The science has to drive everything we do. And the witness of that for us is that we are the only, and we're a fairly large company, we're the S&P 500, we're one of the largest biotechnology companies in the world now. Uh, the, we are the only company in the world that the majority of the board of directors, and I mean majority, are physicians or scientists, and the majority are members of the National Academy of Sciences. So we are actually living what we preach, which is we think, that if you're going to be in a science-based company and try and actually discover things and do the miracle of allowing somebody to take a drug that can really change their lives, you have to be focused on science from top to bottom. Now, it is not a straight line of success. Uh, it certainly wasn't for us. When we started the company, we named the company Regen Neuron, Regenerating Neurons, and we had the idea that if you could clone these things called neurotrophic factors, which are simply proteins that made neurons grow, if we could discover these, bottle them, inject them, spritz them on uh, some degenerating neurons, get people who were heading for a wheelchair to walk again, and sail off into the sunset. That was the, if you will, the vision that we started with. Um, the first disease that we tackled was Lou Gehrig's disease, known uh, by its formal name, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, the eponymous Lou Gehrig, it's not really even sure if he had actual what we call Lou Gehrig's disease today, but he certainly had something like it. We expected to, this to happen very quickly. We'd clone these neurotrophic factors. We'd squirt them into patients. Um, patients would get better. We'd get uh, box seats at Yankee Stadium right behind first base. We'd probably get to throw out the first ball, and, and all would be great. Uh, that didn't happen. Our first drug with ALS fail. We were undaunted. Our second drug with ALS fail. We tried to turn, a lot of people in that trial lost weight, so we tried to make lemonade out of lemons, and we tried to make an obesity drug. That seemed like a good idea, a lot of markets. Science seemed good. That was a, a, a major waste of time and money. Um, but things started to pick up. 
uh, and we were able to stick with the science and begin to realize that we could follow that science to a whole uh, host of now what we would consider breakthrough and important drugs. Um, this graph is to remind you that when you're an entrepreneur, when you're an entrepreneur and you're near the end of your road with no money, you better quickly find out how to get more money. Um, I like to give this talk and say that we begged, borrowed, and stole whatever we could, but I got a sudden surprise to give it. So we begged and borrowed <laughs> everything we could. And uh, look what happened. Um, for, from 1988 till 2011, we lost money every year and more and more money every year burning through over a billion dollars with nothing to show for it. But we stuck with it, and things actually started to get better. Um, and we crossed the, you know, I'm a CEO of a, of a major company, and I don't even know what some of these numbers mean, because I don't think all that important, these quarterly numbers. We are so focused on quarterly earnings, it's really a, a waste of a lot of time. But we had this thing called retained earnings, except none of our earnings were retained. It was retained losses for us. But that finally crossed in 2014, and as you can see, um, we are now uh, a rather successful company. But our success is measured in the patients that we've helped. Yes, we need to be rewarded. Innovation needs to have, um, at the end of the road, uh, some prize, because capital is very agnostic. This is a capital-intensive business. Capital will go where it can make, make money. If it doesn't think it can make money in the drug business, and right now, uh, if you, uh, if no matter what channel you turn on, if somebody's running for president, I can guarantee you they don't like me and they don't like the pharmaceutical industry and we're not as bad as they make us out to be. I'm sure of that. But we have a societal problem, which is how do we have this long-term perspective? How do we fund this long-term um, uh, journey um, be, uh, because it's very important that we do, because the prizes at the end are quite remarkable. This is what our pipeline looks like today, and those are the seven drugs we have approved on, on top. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will tell you that we do amazing things with these drugs. Um, if you look at the patient on the left, that's a patient that has really bad eczema, or what, what the technical name is, atopic dermatitis. Many of you will know people with allergies. Maybe some of you had allergic diseases, had bad eczema as, as a child, or know somebody. These people itch like they have poison ivy 24-7. They can't sleep. They travel. If they were coming up to Cornell for this event, they'd bring their own sheets because they'd be embarrassed to bleed on the sheets and the stat. I, I don't know. It matches the Cornell bread. It's not that big of a deal. But <laughs> it's OK to say that these people are miserable, OK? And we, get, we treat them with our drug Dupixin, and it's life-changing. It literally goes away, the itch goes away, and these people who are psychologically devastated, they can't go out, they, they don't sleep, and now their lives have changed. That's why we do so what we do. Um, it's not because we're entrepreneurs, per se. Uh, un entrepreneurs, in my mind, is more a way, a way of, of, of thinking as opposed to a way of doing. But we'll cover that a little bit more. Uh, this is a gentleman who ha was on his way to hospice care because he had a huge tumor. Um, and I'll never forget when the doctor called me up to tell me, you're not going to believe what happened. We gave me a new drug, and this patient was basically going to hospice care to die. And in a matter of six weeks, his tumor just went away, and he went back to his normal life. <laughs> These are the kinds of stories um, that motivate us to keep doing the kind of things we do um, to try and change people's lives. This person was going blind due to age-related uh, macular degeneration, and he got 75% uh, improvement in the eye that was going blind after just a few shots uh, of uh, ILEA, which is our drug that is uh, uh, sold around the world to make a difference in people with blinding disorders. So we have tried our best um, to do things um, that we wanted to do well by doing good. Um, we, want it, we work in our community. Um, we wanted to have an environment where people felt good about coming to work. 
We wanted to pay it forward. How many of you here um, have ever heard of the Intel Science Talent Search? Just by a show of hands. Um, some of you, in my, if you're as old as I am, it was called the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. You know what it's called today? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good answer. Good guess. <laughs> yes, I knew Cornell had smart people. Um, it's called the Regeneron Science Talent Search. We committed $100 million to, to do that to, to because we thought paying it forward makes a huge difference. And, and how exciting it is to see these young high schoolers doing amazing projects. I'm glad I'm not applying for college now. Um, the stuff that goes on, even at the high school level, is, is rather remarkable. Um, so I would say that um, along the way, we have tried always to keep focused on patients, to do the right thing, to make sure our employees sure, share in the upside. Um, it's really been remarkable. We have people who have worked on the loading dock with the company for 20 years, and when the stock, because they were owners of the company, when the stock took off, um, they actually made a million bucks. Um, and that's the kind of a way, uh, to me, that's the way society can think about, uh, if you, uh, I don't believe in wealth redistribution. Um, I believe that um, giving people opportunity, and giving people an opportunity not only to do things, but to share in the upside, which is what we do, we general, everybody is an owner, and I think that should be the case at every corporation. Um, and one of the things I would say that we are most proud of is that, I don't know how many people here read Science Magazine, but it's the premier magazine in, in the world of science. And for the last six years, for five times, we've been ranked the number one uh, healthcare company in the world. So we're, we're very proud of that. Anyway, um, I thought that was a pretty good talk, but I'll stop now, and, uh, <laughs> and I'll let you in. You know, um, we're get, we got to get back to that curve. That, I'm still thinking about that that curve with the with that red dip that went until 2014. Um, for all of the entrepreneurs in the audience, you you know, there's always hope, right? So um, let's start at the beginning. So you already mentioned you graduated in 1973 and you founded Regeneron in 1988. And you said a little bit about what happened in the beginning, but could you fill in the gap? So what, what was going on in those, in those uh, 15 years? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in a family where education was uh, the most valuable thing you could get. So I got it in spades. I, I, I went uh, from here to the University of Virginia. Um, I was just going to go to medical school there, but then decided to do an MD and a PhD. So I spent seven years there. Um, I came back to Cornell Medical School in New York. I spent one year being an, uh, an intern, which is really truly slave labor back then, um, and then uh, another three years becoming specialized in neurology, and then doing a fellowship uh, after that. So mostly it was getting educated. Okay. So, so um, you know, then you started, tell me a little bit about, um, you said you, you, you were going after an ALS cure. Yes. Um, but say a little bit more about just how Regeneron came to be. Yes, yeah, so I was working in the labs um, and reading the journals uh, and finding out that all the exciting papers were, seemed to me, being published by this company called Genentech, um, which was one of these West Coast uh, biotechnology companies. I didn't even know what that meant, but I kept reading the literature, and they were publishing all the great papers. Uh, and I said, geez, that's interesting. Uh, and so I started learning a little bit about them, and I said, wow, they're interested in sort of um, insulin and, and other metabolic diseases, growth hormone. Maybe I could do what they're doing in neuroscience. I was trained as a neurologist. Um, so I went to my mentor, um, who recently passed away, is one of the world's greatest scientist. He, he was the person I did my MD, PhD with, Al Gilman, who, uh, he won the Nobel Prize uh, um, for figuring out how cells communicate. Um, that was, of course, a big boom to my career, because if you train with somebody like that, that always opens a few doors. And I went to Al, I said, Al, you know, what about starting a company um, to um, uh, take on neurologic diseases? And Al, being Al, said, Len, that's one of the more stupider ideas I've ever heard you suggest. <laughs> OK, 
get back in the lab and do something good. So I, you know, um, I, I'm fairly stubborn. Uh, my father-in-law uh, describes uh, me as he used to tell Harriet uh, if we were having a spat when we were dating. He used to say, well, if you're going to throw him out the door, make sure you lock the window. So um, I, I was, uh, <laughs> my father-in-law had a way with words, and English was not his first language. Um, at any rate, I, I was stubborn. And so I said, you know, I think this could be done. Um, I believe that uh, what my dad taught me was that uh, most people, no matter how accomplished they are, is that they put their pants on uh, one leg at a time. Um, and Genentech couldn't be all that special in my mind, so I said, why not start a company? Um, and so finally, when I decided to do that, I raised a million bucks on a, on a negotiation in a Chinese restaurant with a venture capitalist by the name of George Singh, who we wrote down a deal, and he agreed to give a million bucks to start the company. Um, and then Al said, geez, if you're going to really do this, let's make sure we get a group of super people to help advise you. Uh, let's recruit a, a great young molecular biologist, that was George, uh, and that's how we get started. Yeah, that's terrific. So um, one of the things I observed is that you, your company went public relatively, at a, relatively quickly, only maybe three years after, after it was founded. And I wondered about, well, one, what were the conditions that allowed that to happen, and, and why did you want to do that? Yeah. Um, I didn't know much about the markets or what have you, but I did know that uh, it seemed to cost a, lot, it cost a lot of money to do research. And I learned fairly quickly that capital markets were a, a, a pretty good source, and there was a bit of a, 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 a phase going on where a number of biotechnology companies were being formed and going public. And they had all these fancy venture capitalists backing them, you know, uh, like Kleiner Perkins or, or companies like that. And so um, I, I said, well, let's give it a try. And back then, you know, we had an advisory board and board of directors that had three Nobel laureates on it. Um, we, we had done some pretty good basic research. We had cloned, when I, when I say, whenever I say we, you should hear George, because he's really the genius who, uh, in the lab. And George cloned a bunch of these neurotrophic factors. Um, and we were about to get ready to start spritzing them, if you will, into patients. And uh, people were willing to say that that enterprise was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and they were, uh, I'll never forget it, we went on one of these road shows where you, you go and talk to investors. And the last stop of that road show, that was before the internet, obviously, and all that. You literally had to fly around. And we were, the last stop was in Kansas City. There was some uh, large investors. Merrill Lynch was taking us public. And um, we completed the road show saw our last investor, and this committee from Merrill Lynch gets on the phone and says, Len, we, we think we can do this deal. Um, and we thought we might raise 30 or 40 million bucks at a, at a cheap price. They said, how would you like to raise $99 million at a high price? So being, that's where my entrepreneurial skills came into play. I said, hold on, you're gonna have, we're going to have to think about that. We put them on hold. We danced the jig. We pretended we were thinking about it. <laughs> we got back on the phone and said, if that's the best you can do, we'll take it. <laughs> and we went public uh, and raised 99 million bucks, uh, which to me seemed like more money uh, uh, than we made in the earth. So being an entrepreneur is involved dancing a jig. Uh, a little is that, bit. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> OK. Um, so let's get to this curve. Yeah. Uh, so it's all, you know, the, uh, question I have is that you, you're, you've grown this business. It's been remarkable. Um, and so um, I think you did approximately 6.7 billion in 2018. Uh, 2 point, point billion of, uh, of that was uh, income, net income. It's just, it's just been amazing. But what I didn't know in all of that was this curve. Yeah. Uh, I'm an engineer, and, I, and I, I, I'm still looking at this curve. <laughs> but, it, but say a little bit about that turnaround. Um, and and um, you know, how you could stay you know, optimistic. optimistic. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny. I don't remember that. being too depressed along the way. My son, Adam here, tells me that when we had our first or second failure, I didn't come out of my room for three days. <laughs> I don't believe that. OK, I think that's somewhat <laughs> apocryphal. But I have this notion that, um, that 
as long as I can see a path of some light, and it, you know, no matter how long that tunnel was, I was willing to get back up on the horse. Um, and we had to get back on three times, and we failed three times, knocked down. You know, most companies of markets would have lost faith in them. People would have said, get out of business. Get, maybe I could have, my tail between my legs, gone back to Cornell to try and get back on the faculty. But somehow, I, I don't know, it just seemed like failure is part of the research game. And, um, and it's part of life. Uh, and you're just going to have to deal with it. And, and anybody who thinks that the, the, the simple path is you have an idea, it immediately works. And, and you're getting the Cornell Entrepreneur of the Year award is just, uh, I mean, it might be five years. I should have gotten it five years ago. But I mean, I didn't deserve it in, I didn't deserve it in 1991. So there were a real lot of failures uh, along the way. And we just stuck with it. You, you, I want to sort of talk a little bit more about that. Uh, you, you made it sound as though it's research, but it's also, to what extent is that turnaround about discovery and to what extent is it about sort of business acumen? Yeah, I mean, the only business acumen that really mattered, I think, was this interesting realization that in the old days, if you had a good idea and you were a small company, you would go to some giant company like Merck or Pfizer or something like that, and they would give you 10 million bucks and they would give, offer you a 4% royalty, and if the sales are really high, they'd give you a 6% royalty. And the one thing that I would say that I like to, to say I, we did differently is we said, hold on. The easy part of this business is the marketing side, okay? The hard part of this business is the science side. And we're not giving you our products. I, I'd rather die before giving you my product for a 6% royalty. You know, if we've discovered an actual product that can change people's lives, we're going to get at least 50%. And um, ILEA, we had actually sold three times for 50%, and then people gave it back. Procter & Gamble wanted to get in the drug business. They never thought it would be a $100 million seller. They gave it back to us. Our partner, Sanofi, they paid us $50 million to take ILEA back. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that again. They paid us for $50 million to take out of back, which now sells $6 billion a year. Um, and by the way, I'm very proud of this. We have never raised the price once um, since we launched our in 2011. So um, we are trying, that's usually a time for us. <laughs> uh, we have never raised the price once. We're cognizant of the fact that. Um, it, 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 drugs are expensive, but we do want to get rewarded, and innovation has to be rewarded. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I'm curious about if you could say a little bit about how you've been able to remain in the CEO position for such a long period of time, and in particular, the transitions from going from a tiny startup company into a you know, relatively large uh, corporation. Often, that, that, that there's a transition that occurs at some point. Yes. So yeah. say a little bit about how you were able to do this for 30 years. I remember in 1992 or three, after we went public, the couple of venture capitalists who were still associated with the company got together and, and, and nominated somebody to come to me and say, Leonard, you know, the company's starting to grow. We should get a professional CEO. Mm -hmm. And I say, a professional CEO? I didn't know there was such a thing as a professional CEO. I thought there was just a CEO. Um, I didn't think that was a great idea. Uh, fortunately, uh, there was a lawyer uh, by the name of Joe Flom at a firm called Scadden, which um, uh, he suggested that I, he knew I was going not to wind up with a very high ownership because you have to dilute yourself to fund all this stuff. But he gave, he said, let's give your shares 10 votes and everybody else's one vote. So that helped a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that um, it was once again surrounding ourselves with the right people. In 1995, um, when we had, I don't remember which failure we had, uh, maybe our second or third, a um, couple people on the board said, can't we get somebody to help you guys? Uh, isn't there some wisdom that we're missing here? We seem to do all the science right, but is there something we're missing? And so I picked up the phone and called this, this fellow who was a legend. Um, he was the retiring CEO and chairman of Merck. He discovered the first statin. Um, um, in his own, in, the, in, their, in, in his labs. He was the head of research there, he was a physician. So to me, 
Um, I used to, uh, I used to say to my board, but why can't they would say doctors can't be good CEOs? I said, but what about that guy, Bachelos, who's CEO of Merck, um, and he was the most admired CEO in the world for nine of the ten years that he was uh, CEO. I said, what about him? And you know, they gave me the usual line: Len, you're no boy. Bachelos, and so um, I accepted. I know. Yes, I know Roy Bachelos. Exactly, the Lloyd Benson line. I know Roy Bachelos, and you know Roy Bachelos. I said, well, I don't know Roy Bachelos, but I tell you what, I'm not going to call up one of these knucklehead commercial CEOs because that's not. We, let, uh, they're not going. He's not. He or she wouldn't be much trouble. We picked up the phone and called Roy, and much to our great surprise, uh, Roy uh, recognized the science that was going on. He was retiring, and he. Became, I was chairman at the time. I said, Roy, you be chairman. Help us out, you know. And so Roy has been a friend and mentor of mine for the last 25 years. Uh, we speak almost every day. He's, he's in his late 80s, but he is a, a remarkable, uh, a remarkable um, person. Uh, one of the greatest uh, CEOs, research heads, and greatest philanthropists uh, 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 for the last several decades. And so I got a lot of help. Is what I would say. And that that. That helped me keep uh, keep the job. You know, let's let's stay with that a little bit. Um, I'm always interested in you know this. You're inspiring you know others who are at earlier stages of their careers. I, I always love to hear the mentoring stories because it, it, it's ubiquitous. You know, you can see it at all levels. There's always somebody in the past that made a huge difference. Um, so uh, it, along that line, I'm wondering if you have advice to uh, young people in the audience that may have their own bright idea in their head and, and probably feel it's daunting to get this, this bright idea going in some sense. Um, and uh, you were able to do that. You know, what would you tell them? What I've learned is that the one thing uh, that a young entrepreneur lacks, um, it's not brains, it's not enthusiasm, he or she has great commitment, Willingness to love, they lack experience, and I lack experience. And recognizing that you don't know everything and that experience matters, um, and finding people to surround yourself with people who have that experience um, and are willing to work with you and teach you. Uh, and, you know, Roy Vandis has been uh, amazing in that regard. He has a few quirks, like he says to me, he says, he'll go like this, he'll say, Len. You know, the, the real secret of a good CEO, this, he used to say this to me in the early days, the real secret of a, of a good CEO then is to hire the right people, put them in the right place, and let them do their job. Don't micromanage them. And I said, that sounds good. Roy, why do you call me every day? This is <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Roy was, Roy was and is a great mentor uh, to me. Um, and we have tried to surround ourselves. As I said, we have three Nobel laureates on the board. My uh, partner, George Nicopoulos, is the smartest scientist, I think, of his generation. He's the most prolific drug discoverer, drug hunter uh, 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 in the last 20 years. These are all his discoveries. So I would say being mentored and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship need not be an individual sport. Um, it really can be a team sport. Um, and that's how I have felt about it. And, and I, I would say my secret to what success we've had is recognizing that it is a team sport. And you know, the CEO you know, doesn't know everything, it doesn't have to make every decision. You've got to surround yourself with, with a group of people. Many of the people that work at the company have been, from, been through this, the early failures yeah. and, uh, and stick with it. You know, when you were saying the one thing that you're lacking when you're starting out, in my mind, I thought you were going to say money. Uh, <laughs> and then you said experience, which is great. I mean, because in some ways, I think... Money can be had. A good, yeah. th this is a great country that's willing to finance good ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so I think good ideas, sometimes you've got to be persistent and, and, and really pound the pavement. Um, I, my, one of my favorite things to do is to run into people who turn us down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's particularly satisfying. <laughs> and there is a long list of them. <laughs> Interesting. Um, you've touched on this. It's a sensitive topic uh, in the in the 
pharma world, uh, but drug pricing and, um, you know, I, I just, you said a little bit, I'd like you to expand right. a, bit, a bit on this in terms of, uh, you know, we do have a responsibility to, to, to uh, provide drugs at, at a price people can afford. On one hand, on the other hand, uh, you know, there, there, there's the enormous cost of getting new drugs to, to market. Tell me a little bit yeah. about how you think so, about that. I, I think this, uh, we're at risk of, of, of killing uh, our industry, um, and it may be uh, suicide. And who's the weak? Uh, who's killing people? Well, I say it may be suicidal. It may okay. be the industry itself, uh -huh. uh, but it may be politicians. But let me see if I can expand upon that a little bit and, and, and at least give you my perspective. First of all, do I wake up in the morning worrying whether or not some Russian is going to come up with a, uh, a great drug that's going to make our drug obsolete? No. Do I worry about some Chinese uh, biotech startup? Yes, I worry about them, unfortunately, because a lot of them are stealing American technology. That's a truism. But they're not doing what we do. And why is it? What's different about the United States? Why are most of the drugs, um, the most of the advances, why do they come from the United States? Well, they come from the United States because we have this great ecosystem. We have, we used to have at least, great public education. Um, we have science talent searches, things like that. We have great university-based um, science education. We have an amazing National Institutes of Health and NSF, which funds intramural and extramural research. We have entrepreneurs. I see you out there. We have capital markets, we have venture capitalists, we have private equity, we have the best developed capital market system in the world. And that ecosystem, um, and at the end of the day, we have an economy um, where if you come up with something innovative, you can, you, have, you can get trained, you do all this sort of stuff, and you actually come up with a drug, you can actually uh, have some investor who's been pouring in billions and want something back at the back end. And I say capital is agnostic. Um, it doesn't have a strong commitment to my industry, um, nor does it have a strong uh, commitment to the Tesla uh, company. <coughs> they will, capital will go where it can make money. Um, I'm a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. I don't believe in unbridled capitalism. I believe in regulated capitalism. Um, I believe we should have a purpose for what we do. But the capitalism is what allows us to do it. Uh, there was a great, uh, and so what's going on today in pricing and what have you? The problem is is that everybody hates the drug companies because we don't have a good insurance system to cover drugs. And people have to write checks at their pocketbook. If, if you go into the hospital, and God forbid you have to have some major surgery, a triple bypass, you get sick, you go in the ICU, you have a pulmonary embolus, you get out, you get sick again, you're in there for six weeks and you run up a bill of $500,000 and they wheel, give, and they take you out with the wheelchair and you stand up and you say goodbye, you don't even think about that 500,000 bucks because your bill is about 500 bucks, right? <laughs> we have a good insurance system as we should. The trouble is, is you go to the drugstore and the drug that you take is going to cost you, and you've just spent $500,000 in six weeks, and you don't want to get another, you don't want to get another heart attack, and the drug is going to cost you 1000 bucks, let's say, a month to, pre to prevent that, and you, when you have to pay 200 dollars your reaction is going to be, those crooks, what are they going to charge so much money for? Um, and that's sort of this, this, so when you have a poor insurance system, and we keep putting more and more of the cost on individuals, that's a formula for a, a popular unrest and revolt against the system. If you couple that with the fact that, like in any industry, there are a lot of crooks um, and, and unethical people, people buying up drugs that cost $100, buying up the patent rights for it, not inventing a damn thing, not sweating in the labs, just manipulating uh, some paper, and that $100 job all of a sudden is costing $10,000. That's going to piss off a lot of people, as, as well it should. Um, I have spoken out publicly against these egregious um, practices. Somebody, I was on a panel at Forbes and I couldn't believe it. I called him straight out. I wasn't, I, 
I don't get invited to a lot of the other companies' holiday parties, uh, but I don't really care. But this CEO, he thought it was a good thing when, when somebody was going to challenge his patents to sell his patent to an Indian tribe because there was some loophole in the law that you couldn't, you couldn't sue an Indian tribe or something. I mean, give me a break. So these are the sorts of things that are, are, are creating a very bad name for our industry. And in contentious, polarized time, when nobody can agree on anything, what people can agree on is that the drugs are too expensive. But when people say drugs are too expensive, they don't really mean that. Because they don't actually know how, drug, how expensive drugs are, or they're not. Now, a cancer drug, which could cost $100,000, and you have to pay $10,000. If you cut the cancer drug in half, you still have to pay $5,000. That's impossible for the average person. So it's the copay or the cost that an individual has to pay, their portion of it, that is unaffordable. So we need a better insurance system. And the industry is going to be suicidal uh, in the, if, if it doesn't stop raising prices. Prices, you, you know. I'm proud of the fact that we have one of the best-selling drugs in the world without ever, and we priced it below the competition when we got the market, never raised the price since. And I, th I think that's responsible behavior, um, but, but drug discovery is hard. So if you take the average CEO, and let's say they're sitting on $10 billion a year, and they need to grow their company at 10%, their shareholders are demanding 10% growth. So they've got to come up with a new drug that sells a billion dollars a year more. That's hard, it's hard to come up with these drugs. I'm telling you, this is a hard business. But it's not hard to raise your prices 10%. So if you have $10 billion, now you have $11 billion of sales, and you can look like you're a growth company. And that's what our industry got addicted to, all these um, uh, price raises, which were intended to obscure the fact how hard this business is. But the politicians haven't helped. Um, I like one of my uh, local uh, representatives, I think he said it best. He said that many of the politicians these days, um, they love milk, but they hate cows. Okay, you think about that. You know, they, they, they want to spread all the wealth around, and you entrepreneurs are gonna create in society all the great jobs, et cetera, but they hate the, the, the people actually doing it. Um, and so we can't have that. And I don't know what the right answer is, so we have to be more responsible but all this is going to be, you know, a, a rounding errors compared to the scores of millions of people with Alzheimer's disease where there is nothing in sight. The most recent drugs that people gave a lot of hope for, which I really didn't have a lot of hope for, failed. And a lot of us in this room, unfortunately, are going to get demented from Alzheimer's disease. And it is going to be a disaster to take care of everybody. So we need... Uh, to invest in companies and take the risk, yet we're going to have these billion dollar failures before some small company somewhere, maybe it come from Cornell, who knows, maybe Regeneron is going to come up with a cure. But we have to have rewards for that, because if we don't have rewards, capital, uh, the cost uh, won't get there. A long winded answer is to no, say it's, that it's, there's a lot of great. problems out there. Yeah, it's great, but it's great insight. Um, uh, let's see, I would like to, you know, Say a little bit, because you, you did allude to this as well, about your views kind of on corporate responsibility. Um, right. You, 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 uh, you were talking about the, pro, the, the program, yes. the, 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 the sort of former Intel program that you've taken over, et cetera. I, so I, I truly believe that companies cannot simply um, exist for the benefit of their shareholders. Um, the shareholder-centric view that has evolved in, in, if you study corporations, where my fiduciary duty is supposed to be to only and completely to my shareholders. Now, what does that mean? I don't even know who my shareholders are. They, somebody owned my stock yesterday, doesn't own my stock tomorrow. Is, are those my shareholders? You know, I had a proposal that I thought about moving forward where you would give more say in companies the longer you held on to the stock because we, we, the short-termism is really killing us, yeah. and we have to we have to uh, we have to think uh, um, we have to think long-term. But I think that companies have a responsibility that's broader. They have other stakeholders. We view our responsibility before our shareholders are to the patients we deal with. Do no harm is a very big deal. If you want to know what I worry about, it's not that we might get some competition and 
sell this drug is God forbid we make some mistake and we hurt people rather than help them. That's sort of our number one. The second thing is we have, I really believe we have an obligation to our employees. Um, we give every single employee in our company is a shareholder. And when they walk in the door, they, they become a shareholder and they get options to get more shares depending upon how they do on a merit basis. As I told you the story about the, uh, the guy in the loading dock who made a million bucks, um, I think that companies should have a greater responsibility to their employees. I would propose, um, I would love to see all companies um, give out a certain fraction of their stock every year to their employees. I think it, it, there's nothing particularly magnanimous about, it, magnanimous about it. You actually get much better employees and you get a lot more done. And when you're, and when you're vested in something, okay, you're going to go the extra mile. Uh, and if you're not vested, so if you're going to start a company, I would make sure you spread the, spread the wealth around in terms of, of stuff. I think you also have obligations to your community, to our society. Um, I try my best to be a leader and, and talking about the problem and recognizing the problem of, of, of people who can't afford their drugs. Um, we try and do our best um, to give drugs away based on, on, on financial need or provide assistance when we're allowed to. It's, um, it's a responsibility that we take seriously. And our employees, as you saw from one of the slides, we have a day for doing good day at Regeneron, where everybody is paid to, instead of coming to work, they get their regular pay, but they go out and pick one of a hundred different projects in the community to work on. We have, um, uh, we happen, happen to have a son, uh, Adam's younger brother, who's uh, 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 developmentally disabled, and I think it's important that we provide jobs for the disabled, and we. Uh, we hire uh, a lot of uh, disabled people at the company, and they're very good employees. So I think that, to me, is, is what capitalism should be, which is you, it, it has to be, it can't be blindly loyal to only to mm -hmm. shareholders. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. I'm going to look, for, I'm gonna look to Zach, because I'm not quite sure. We started a little yeah, late. Yeah, so it's 2.30. So I think we have... Time for well, two, two or questions, three audience, audience questions. Yes. Um, it's going to be time. We have you know three o'clock a session to start back in the other building. So if you have a question, raise your hand up right here. Right. So providers are taking on a lot of burden with their workflows, like EHRs and having to document more and more. One of those is also related to if you get injectables in the office, Medicare Part B by a bill. And there's a lot of legislation now to maybe change that. What would you recommend for an ideal? So to repeat the question, um, one of our drugs, ILEA, is uh, a drug that the retinal specialist buys, okay, um, and then bills the government uh, for the government share, the patient for their share. Um, it's called a buy and bill, if you will, uh, model. Um, and the government gives that physician some sort of a markup, two, three percent, sometimes it is higher, depends on whether there's a sequester going on. And, and the question was, do I have any views on how this should change? Well, I think, and I've met with the secretary, Azar, on this, um, and, I would, and I've told him, and, and I'll say it here, that there have been significant abuses in the system. Um, and what I would recommend is that drugs that are not truly physician administered. Look, I lead as a drug that has to be injected directly into the eye. That's physician administered, there's no getting around it. But a drug that, be, that could be given by self-injection, which the doctor wants to give by intravenous injection because there's some margin there, that, that has to be sort of squeezed out of the system. But in general, the solution, I believe, has to be we have to stop pushing an ever-increasing share of the cost of drugs to patients. But I said it before, but let me give you a concrete example. If, if your copay, if, if you have a drug that's, a, let's say it's $100,000, which is what some cancer drugs cost, and they're miracle drugs, and they make cancers go away. If, if you have to pay ten or $15,000, you know, the 50% you know, of people in the United States, if they, if they have a $500 car expense, okay, they cannot pay for it. And we do have a significant problem in this country in that regard. But people shouldn't have to go bankrupt or, or, or not feed their children because they can't get a 
uh, uh, they can't afford a drug. I would have a system which, th this notion that the reason for these copays was that they wanted people with skin in the game so that it would force patients to try and hunt down cheaper products. But it really doesn't work that way. And do you really, do people who can't afford 500 bucks for a car, does it matter whether you, you, your skin in the game is 10,000 or 20,000? It's all, it's all just telephone numbers that, 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 can't, uh, that can't be managed. So we need a, I would recommend a system that's a, a better insurance system um, where the copay, um, there are a few creative ideas floating around. Some people have said, listen, the government could come up with a price. If you like the government's price, this was one of my board, one of my board members came up with this. If you like the government price, we'll give you extra couple of years of patent protection. If you don't like our price, charge whatever you want and do do your own thing. Um, there are solutions, but it is so hard. It is so hard to get them in in this polarized environment. That's tough. Yeah, right here in front. Um, so I guess the general you describe yourself as a science science first company. And I guess I'm curious how that affected like in a practical sense your decision making, at least in the first part, like with you know, when that red line was going down and people were pushing, like you guys need to change things. Like how did you stay true or what examples led you to stay true to your science first methodology? Look, if you're gonna start and run a public company, okay, there is two things you're gonna have to make a fundamental choice between two two paths. You're either going to let what the market tells you they want done and do it, or are you going to tell the market what you want to do and do it? And we chose the latter. Many people chose to choose the former. They don't have to think. The market tells them, don't worry about the long term. Stop investing so much in research. Don't pay attention. Don't do all this science. You know, charge more for your drugs. This, that. You know, that's what the market wants. But I don't believe that's what leadership is. We believe that, you know, and, and if the market doesn't like it, so our stock will go down for a while. We, it, but it'll come back if we deliver. So we've, we've, we've been in all places. Uh, and there's some people on Wall Street analysts that just hate us. They just hate us. Because we, we are unwilling to change our ways. Um, we have a saying that if, if George and I are in our office together arguing, which we do almost every day, and two people come running to the, to the door, and by the way, here's a good thing if you're going to start a company. Every single door we generate on from day one has a glass panel or a glass door. Um, not because that looks so cool, because I just did, I wanted people, hey, I didn't want bad stuff going on behind closed doors. No, nothing that shouldn't happen. But more importantly, I wanted people to feel that everybody was accessible and everybody could approach anybody um, at all times. At any rate, if two people come in and they want, they're both each one is waving a piece of paper, and one of them is waving last week's ILEA sales, and the other one is waving the results of an experiment that's really exciting, but has no chance of generating one dollar of sales for at least a dozen years. If we're not more interested in this one, it's time for us to hang up the spikes. Um, that's our feeling. And so we're never going to be dictated. We don't care really what Wall Street says. A lot of people on Wall Street don't like us, uh, but that's okay. Uh, we're trying to run an enterprise that uh, we actually care what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years. OK, one more. Alice. Okay. So you started with Genra 30 years ago. Probably at that time, there's not as many uh, academic researchers start companies at that time. Nowadays, a lot of more enthusiasm from people in academic research want to enter into that world. In your view, what is uh, maybe the similarity yeah. Uh, stay the same as 30 years ago, what is the difference now for the entrepreneurs now, and what's your advice for today's entrepreneurs from academic world? Right. So I found, I remember when I went, when I left the faculty, the chairman of neurology, a very famous professor, a guy by the name of Fred Plum, he wrote the book called Stupor and Coma, he's an extremely famous guy. <clears throat> he said, Len, why don't you, you want to do this, why don't you take a leave of absence and um, you know, so it doesn't work out. You you know, you'll still be on the faculty. And I thought about it, and I went. And then I came back in a week. I said, "This is crazy. I can't recruit people and do what I want to do if I'm not willing to cut the cord and take the risk. How am I going to recruit and get other people to take the risk?" So, I think that the one problem I see now is, you know, you're not a you're not a professor worth your weight in 
in anything in, in the biological sciences world unless you're associated with a biotech company. And I can't tell you how many people we see like that, Alice. But the, the point I'm trying to get at is that I do believe that academicians have a much higher calling of figuring out basic research. When you see something that might be exciting enough to maybe want to start an enterprise around, you should license that out and get some reward for it. Or you could have to say, I'm willing to change careers, which is what I did, and, and take the risk and, 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 and enjoy the reward. But I, I see today the different environments, too many people are sort of straddling that fence of being half academician, yeah. half entrepreneur. And I know the faculties like it, the deans like it, <laughs> it brings money in. But I, I would like to see people be willing to, you know, I love the fact that faculty is entrepreneurial and that they're thinking about how their products can be applied. But I just, I don't want, I, we're not going to cure cancer um, without fundamental basic research. The whole excitement in cancer right now is how to harness your immune system. And that didn't come from people trying to figure out a cure for cancer. That just came from people trying to understand how the body reacts to viruses and foreign things and things like that. So anyway, the long way to the answer is today, there's a lot more straddling going on. Um, I, I took the clean break. Uh, I would like to see more people, if they're going to do it, take, take the plunge. So I think I'm going to call it here. Um, so Len, I, you, you mentioned that there's some people in Wall Street that don't, don't like you guys, but we do. Uh, so <laughs> we, we say, uh, you know, again, congratulations, and thank you for taking time. Thank you very much.